So what was it like working with Mark Lanigan as a vocalist? Well, I think the longer he sang, the more he figured out what he could do with that bass register, a low tenor thing. Hmm. That's kind of his signature now. Did you ever double his voice? A lot of the time, yeah. He chewed tobacco. Uh, as he was singing? Yeah. Very yeah. Interesting. It was always hard to make his voice read against all those guitar overdubs. Mark learned the hard way that if you leave Lee on his own, he'll just do guitar overdubs. By the time we got to mixing the Invisible Land record, Mark was like, like what? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you know? so, That's funny. He was at home in his low octave, which hadn't really blossomed yet. Mark Lanigan, as we know him now, you can start to hear, you know, that, that thing kind of jump out where the screams all land, you know. Yeah. And when he goes for a big note, he's got the right lyric and the right turn and the right push behind it. There was a couple of moments where I went like, oh, shit, you know. He's really turning into something really wonderful, you know, and he was always good and he's always lyric and melodic. If he wasn't happy, uh, then the whole vibe got just, you know, yeah. then there was no vibe and you're just trying to make Mark happy. But Mark was also in a lot of physical pain uh, and uh, he had really bad headaches and, uh, and, and he was totally sober the whole time, you know. Uh, I'm only, it's none of my fucking business, but you know, when you're making a complete, you know, commitment to doing psychedelic records, I was the only guy that smoked pot. Nobody smoked pot, hmm. you know, a couple of the guys in the bed and drank a little bit, but, uh, you know, uh, Mark was serious about doing it. I mean, he, you know, and we went through a kind of a sound search on his voice and played with different kinds of compression and turning off compression. So no, there was a, a whole very concerted effort we started with this neumann uh because it was the best that came 84 i was telling you about earlier and i think that's the vocal mic on uh other worlds and clairvoyance and eventually we switched over to an sm58 which is kind of a pedestrian microphone but it's a great microphone to scream into i know you've had a whole uh, video about kurt cobain screaming and microphones and all of that uh, okay. but you know Mud honey, we're using SM58s. Everybody's using SM58s, so we just quit fucking around with trying to do something high quality or fancy and just use an SM58. Mm -hmm. So yeah, visible lantern and and uh, even if and especially when we're just you know Mark singing into a mic on a stand. Mm. One of the other things you got to think about too is when you're out, have an eight track, that means at a certain point you have to erase the scratch vocal. Huh. There's no way to save the scratch vocal. And even though the, the sound was shitty and there was tons of bleed, Mark Lanik and scratch vocals were so good. And I would try to talk him out of it, but there wasn't like any fancy digital thing where you could bounce it off someplace with the idea that you know, eventually you'd figure out some way to use it or something like that. And hmm. it didn't sound like, like a real vocal because it had guitars and cymbals and everything in it. But Mark Lanik and scratch vocals. Which, and he yeah, he delivered on every fucking take. There wasn't a scratch vocal that wasn't as, as good as it could get. As somebody who later really learned how to recognize a good take, the idea that there aren't any live Mark Lanigan takes from that whole period where I worked with him, I'm just embarrassed. You know, that's just stupid. You know, but that's just the reality of it. And, and then it's also that's working with an artist and understanding. It's like, there's no way I'm putting that vocal out, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I hear you. So, I mean, erase it, you know? So would he be the kind of person that he would sing like 15, 20 minutes, take a break and come back? Or would he be one of the guys that would go for like two hours straight? Like what was what was he like in that regard? I think we had evenings where we just sang vocals, you yeah. know, like four hours of singing, three hours of singing. It was just like at a certain point there was just sort of a workman, you know, thing. We're like, all right, you know, we've done all the guitars. Let's do all the vocals. I didn't know anything about different kinds of singers. I, you know, I hadn't learned fuck, you know, so... Hmm. Uh, I, I learned a lot about recording vocals, working with Lanigan, and I think we tried all kinds of things, you know. Hmm. Remember, there was one song, I forgot which one it was, I'm pretty sure it was an Invisible Lantern song, where uh, Mark didn't want to finish it or didn't want to finish writing the words or something. Forget what the thing was, and he made like a whole party out of it, where it says, okay, Rod Doak, you know, the same thing. You go sing it now. Says, okay, Lee, you sing it now. And Lee would go out and do his version of it. And we'd make a mix of that. And uh, it says, okay, Fisk, you go out and sing it now. So there's this one song that's got 
And there's this cassette of it so, somewhere. Maybe it's gone by now, but it's just me doing all these rough mixes of like, <laughs> these, and everybody in the studio sang the song because Mark was just having fun, kind of not finishing the vocal. That's funny. <laughs> you know? So in general, like, how many takes would you get for his vocals? Like, would you do a lot of takes or just not not that many? It seemed to go well. He was never like, hey, I just nailed that. You know, he's not that kind of guy. So even when it was great, he still had all kinds of misgivings, but he could walk away from it going, that's as good as it's going to get tonight. Neither of us knew what we were doing. You know, we figured out the you know, SM58, and I think there was an old Symmetrix uh, 522 compressor. He just did a great job of figuring out his shit, and it was by, you know, a lot of learn by, you know, by doing kind of thing, you know. So he did a lot of shit was good enough, but, you know, for him, you know, he's uh, got a, 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 a kind of a relentless thing about perfection and all of that. So I think that drove him to, you know, do all this other, you know, God, it's really inaccurate, really, really badly worded. But, you know, what he turned into was because he wasn't happy with what he was. Hmm. And without getting into the book, but the idea that he was saddled with doing this kind of genre music, you know, the psychedelic thing, you know, it's like he loved it. He dug it. But like all the Screaming Trees, he listened to tons of music. So um, the idea that he doesn't want to talk about you know, the old stuff or play the old songs or anything like that. I mean, that, that makes complete sense. Hmm. You know, it's, it was where he landed. It's how he got started. But, you know, it, I don't think it was his first love. Yeah, fair enough. And in a small town, you know, there's not another band, you know. So I think, you know, he loved all these guys. But, you know, it wasn't necessarily, you know, a, a good fit from the beginning, you know. And then, and then you go to Seattle and then you're in the goddamn 90s. You know, you know, and, and you're from Eastern Washington, so you're not part of you know the UW hipster thing or the North End metal thing or any of this shit. So so they're outsiders in the middle of this thing that's incredibly political and high pressure and weird and surprise they got to be friends with Nirvana. Also the hicks from the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, so. And maybe that's why they connected, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The following is from Screaming Trees drummer Mark Pickerel, where he discusses Kurt Cobain's admiration for Screaming Trees singer Mark Lanigan. Quote, They traded a lot of tapes and had conversations about different artists they liked. Apparently, I don't know if Mark turned Kurt onto Lead Belly or if Kurt was already a fan, but at some point, Mark approached me about playing drums for a project that he and Kurt wanted to start, which would really focus on blues, particularly Lead Belly's catalog. I believe we were also talking about playing songs by all the great bluesmen. I got really excited about it and was envisioning this super group that was bound for success. Sort of the modern day Northwest version of Cream. It was funny because having been in a band with Mark for so long, his personality in the Screaming Trees was he couldn't help but really be the band leader. He just is a natural leader, is very outspoken and can be very aggressive. The couple of rehearsals we had, I saw a different side of Mark, one that was much quieter. He seemed to have a great deal of respect for Kurt and Chris. At the same time, Kurt seemed intimidated by Lanigan's talents and vision. End quote. This supergroup that Mark Pickerel is referring to, of course, would be known as The Jury. On August 20th and 28th, 1989, the band recorded four tracks with producer Jack and Dino, including a version of Where Did You Sleep Last Night? Later in this video, I'm going to show you a clip from one of my interviews with Jack and Dino where he reflects on this. But first, I'm going to share with you a quote from Mark Pickerel where he discusses how the project came together. Quote, We were all becoming big blues fans during a similar point in time. I think Lanigan approached me with it because he knew that I was already a big Lead Belly fan and just a blues fan in general. And since Kurt and Chris were both becoming fans of the same genre, we thought it'd be cool to be the first band out of the Northwest that already had some notoriety to try and forge ahead with a different sound or a different vision. I believe we learned a version of Where Did You Sleep Last Night from a cassette that I had. I think Kurt brought a cassette version of Ain't It A Shame. Grey Goose may have been Lanigan. I think we started exclusively with Lead Belly and then we were going to branch out from there. The original idea was just to do a session devoted to Lead Belly, and then go back in later on and do some other blues artists as well. Mark's vocals with Kurt's vocals could have led to something really powerful, I think, but the irony is, it was that combination of those two personalities that slowed things down. They were like junior high kids at a dance, a couple of wallflowers. I felt like I was the cheerleader of the entire session, always making suggestions and trying to get us to move in a certain direction. 
or to try a certain song, or even sometimes suggesting who might sing the song. Neither Mark or Kurt really wanted to take the initiative to make a lot of decisions. It's funny now that everyone's calling the project a jury, because no one else seemed to be all that excited about the idea at the time. Kurt really wanted to call it Lithium. It seemed as though Mark was satisfied with the name, but not necessarily excited about it. And I don't remember if Chris had an opinion one way or the other about it. But Kurt definitely did not want to call it the jury. And the funny thing is, I don't really care for that name anymore. But it's a little too late for that. Who knows what we might have done if we'd been able to get together once a year for a couple of weeks. Lanigan and I have massive record collections, so there would have been a wealth of music for us to listen to, to learn from, research, and recreate. I really regret that it didn't happen. End quote. Here's the Jack and Dino clip, guys. If you'd like to see the full interview with Jack and Dino, the link is available below. You know, when people think of um, Where Did You Sleep Last Night, they often think of the MTV Unplugged version. But you actually recorded, from what I understand, the original one that Mark Lanigan and Kurt Cobain did together. Is this correct? Correct. And what was the story there exactly? I may get this wrong because nobody has asked me about this for a long time. Um, at some point, there was a session where Mark Lanigan and Mark Pickrell, the drummer from The Screaming Trees, and Kurt Cobain and Chris Novoselic were going to come in and record a side project that they'd been doing where they supposedly were writing some songs together. Now, they booked the time, and then apparently they never wrote any songs together. Or as Kurt said, well, we wrote some songs together, but we forgot them all. I don't know if it ever happened, actually. Mm -hmm. But he said, what we're going to do instead is we're just going to record some Lead Belly tunes. And I thought, okay. Um, so they came in and recorded... And I think this is when that session took place. They recorded Where Did You Sleep Last Night. They recorded Ain't It a Shame, which is on the box set. And something called Grey Goose, which I had no memory of for years and years because it doesn't have a vocal. It's literally one riff over and over again. It's not very exciting. But there it was on the master tapes when we finally pulled it out. Um, they just, for some reason, nobody bothered singing on it that day. And uh, it ended up on the box set, I think, that was all they managed to do that day. One song with Mark singing, one song with Kurt singing, and an instrumental. And uh, and I asked them, what do I put on the log sheet? And they said, I'll call it the jury. I said, okay. So, but, it, you know, it wasn't really a band. But it was the only time I got to record Mark Pickerel drumming with Chris and Kurt. And I think that is where that version of Where Do You Sleep Last Night came from. Because... Sometime, sometime after that, when I was recording Mark Lanigan's first solo record, I think the subject of that song came up and we decided to just put that on the end of it. That's why that song is on the winding sheet. There's another song on the winding sheet called Down in the Dark, uh, where we got Kurt to come in and do a backing vocal, and I'm doing a little electric guitar on it as well. Mm -hmm. Probably the only thing on which I'm playing guitar with Kurt singing that exists, which is interesting. I haven't really thought about that. Uh, so, um, yes, but that was the version, that arrangement of the song, I think, is what inspired Kurt to do the song at the Unplugged session much later. Really? Probably so. You know, although really, Kurt was, Kurt was present when we recorded the Mark Lanigan version. So, I mean, I'm sure they arranged it together. Anyway, this is all speculation. So for you, um, when you listen to, I guess, the Unplugged version, uh, how does it compare compared to the versions that you were involved with? Like, what do you think of it? The arrangement is the same. Um, the difference really is the instrumentation and the vocal. He sings it very similar to how Mark Lanigan sings it. But, you know, he puts the sort of curt passion into it really yeah. different players different instrumentation i think the only thing in common is i mean kurt's playing acoustic on it 